I'm very curious why anybody would vote for the Republicans or the Democrats, and I'm not trying to be divisive or disparaging here. I may actually read the comments on this one because I'm very curious. Because to me, it seems like it's a corrupt system of entrenched people that are protecting their own interests. And at the, uh, the media, a lot is also complicit in this because the media is 70% funded by Big Pharma. So they're not going to do anything that would bring out any stories that could damage the business interests of Big Pharma. And we've created this kind of upper echelon of our society where the political class and the upper income people have a kind of like their entrenched interests that are hurting the rest of us. For example, all of the stuff going on at Boeing was only possible because Boeing had so much financial cloud within the administrations, both parties, that they convinced the FAA that they could do their own oversight, their own testing. And over 20 years, they've allowed the quality to go down because they've become a profit, profit sharing. Uh, their goal has become to increase earnings per share. They were no longer concerned about safety and making good planes. And everyone knew this was happening. The FAA knew, the people in Congress know, and they allowed this. Um, same way with the CDC, um, they forbid anyone, and, and both administrations forbid free speech to question the COVID lockdown, the COVID vaccines, the forced mandates. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. We have Wall Street. Wall Street just enriching itself when we the housing bubble was obvious to everyone and Greenspan kept saying we've never had a housing collapse housing prices have never gone down they will never go down they were all lying to us then we also know that Bush all the presidents all of their foreign invasions of other countries the last defensive war we had was World War II the other ones we've just gone in um, this whole thing with weapons of mass destruction in Iraq was all a lie, was all a ruse. And Kim Iverson, she had on a structural engineer. There are a lot of engineers who are questioning why World Trade Center 7 fell in the afternoon of the crap, of the planes flying into the towers that Trade Center 7 blocks away, collapsed, like in a demolition type of collapse. That afternoon, hours later, you know, you're not allowed to question things. I could go on and on. So we have um, Big Pharma running the show at their own interest at the expense of ours. We have Wall Street running the show at a big expense to us, just benefiting this upper class. And we have the military industrial complex, which is the war machine running the show. And we have these special interests and the politicians enriching themselves at our expense. We, the taxpayers, we, the people, are being used and gaslit with the media that's complicit. And then they try to silence our free speech. Okay. Thank God for the court system. Or we, I wouldn't even be allowed to make this video because the administration, both parties have interfered with all of the social media companies. You know, they tracking everyone. I don't really care, but it's trying to silence people. And now they're trying to get rid of TikTok. And one reason they could be trying to get rid of TikTok now is because Kennedy is really getting a lot of attention on TikTok because young people really like him. And they're trying to do everything to get rid of Kennedy and any third parties. Now, I believe we need to have fresh voices and honest voices and different voices to compete in the political system so that we actually have a choice. There is no difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. They're all collaborating on promoting their special interests. And during the COVID lockdown, we made a billionaire every day for 500 days. They shut down the businesses and they siphoned the money up to these people. And I believe we need third party candidates. We need open debates with third party candidates. 
I remember in the 70s, I'm older than a lot of people, Ross Perot, he got a huge percent, I think it was 30% of the popular vote, and that scared the Democrats and the Republicans, really scared them, and they were like, we will never ever again allow this, you know, threat to our, in, our power. And so they started changing the laws. The debate was changed. The, the, the debate was owned by, I forgot who ran the debates. Someone bought them out and made it so that the debates could only be Republicans and Democrats. No more third parties allowed in the debates. And they also changed the laws on the state level so that in order to be a third party candidate, you had to go through a bunch of hoops and every state made the hoops different. You had to get a certain number of signatures um, of the public to get on the ballot, which in a way that kind of makes sense, right? Because you don't want to have like a thousand people on the ballot. But in, it, it became like very onerous and very expensive. And so that's how they've been able to pretty much keep third parties out. And then they gaslight us and convince us that if you vote for anyone other than the Republicans or the Democrats, then you are, your vote is useless. That's gaslighting. And the Republicans and Democrats pretty much are just name calling. I haven't heard any new ideas come out of any of these people. I want to hear new ideas. I want to hear people who are excited about change. I want to hear someone talk about our national debt, the homelessness, the distress in people's personal lives, you know, the pollution, the forced vaccine mandates, how to, how to actually make our country productive again, um, how we can have a middle class again. Um, you know, instead of talking about who's going to pay for sick care, why don't we start talking about actually making people healthy? Instead of talking about Medicare for all, why don't we start talking about why people are so sick in the first place? The United States had the worst outcome on COVID deaths of any nation on the planet because we're so fucking sick. Six, uh, 60 or 80% of Americans are obese. And this is also affecting children. No, the candidates aren't talking about any of that. They don't want to shake things up. They just want to keep their power going. So they're kind of useless. We need someone to shake it up. Another thing I want to say is like, is Biden the best you got? Come on, Democrats. I'm sure there's some up and coming fresh ideas. Is Biden the best you got? I mean, he's kind of old and decrepit. And same with Trump. Is he the best you've got? You know, <laughs> uh, I mean, I find these people, I don't hate either, either of these people, but Biden is just this fumbling old fool. Uh, and Trump to me seems like this um, he very charismatic guy who's just out to, you know, enrich himself. He's like a, a con man, charming artist. I don't know. Um, I don't hate either of them, but none of them have any fresh ideas. So... I think that we need more people on the ballot that have some interesting new ideas. Uh, I personally think uh, Kennedy is a great candidate, um, but the interesting thing is that they don't want him around. That's why they're trying to get rid of TikTok, in my opinion, and that's why they will not give him Secret Service protection. Every presidential candidate for decades has gotten Secret Service protection, but the Biden administration is refusing to give Kennedy Secret Service protection. Because they don't want him to win. They want him, they don't want him to win. And so it's kind of dirty politics, in my opinion. Um, so his um, security costs a million dollars a month. And there was some kind of mishap recently where someone did try to, you know, shoot him uh, at an airport, someone pretending to be a U.S. Marshal. So you have to be super careful. But my point being that, you know, you don't have to vote for uh, Kennedy or, you know, but I'm just saying, like, we need to open our eyes to the system. That's why I'm so glad that we have YouTube, for example, because it's given a platform for journalists who have left the mainstream media to come and expose a lot of things and give us a new ideas and give us new voices. Some of the news channels I like are like Kim Iverson, Jimmy Dore. 
breaking points, the hill. Um, I might have left somebody out, um, but they're actually reporting on stuff that is censored away from the other, you know, cable news. And the cable news are losing a lot of their audience because I think I think people are just tired of being lied to. Yeah, so I would like to see our country actually built on something that's authentic and hopeful. Like as far as the whole thing with the uh, vaccines and forced vaccines or the food industry, you know, I think that we need to allow actual science to prevail, not just gaslighting people and having special interests run everything. So, you know, we still have hope that we can um, make change in this country. You know, we still have hope, but people have to stop being so blind to this two-party system and act as if that's the best we can do. You know, we, we're running into a dead-end wall here with the national debt. Did you know that the national, we are using all of our income to pay the debt on the national debt. We're not a rich country anymore. We're a broke country. The only reason that we've been able to borrow, borrow, borrow is because the dollar has been the reserve currency and is the reserve currency. And we have abused that privilege. Personal debt is climbing at an exponential rate People are using their credit cards to buy basic foods, gas, whatever. We are a nation in debt. No one's talking about that. They're acting like it's all okay. People are acting like they're not addressing the real issues. That's the problem. They're not addressing the real issues. They're not addressing the real issues. They're not unifying people. You know, they want to divide people and make you think that it's Democrats against Republicans, us against them. That's the whole thing. You know, we need, I want to feel like I'm part of uh, a solution, a part of like a spirit of hope and of change. Like I love to pay my taxes if they're going for something good, but I pay taxes and it's just going for crap. You know, Medicare paying for sick people because they're fucking fat. And they, no one gives a shit. They're just like, well, who should pay for these sick people? Why do we have so many sick people in this country? Why is our debt so high? Why are we waging all these foreign wars? You know, why are we, is our, one of our biggest industries is probably Wall Street, the financialization of nothing. Why is the stock market going up when people are so broke? Like, what is the end goal here? What what are we doing? You know, I look out my window, everything is beautiful. You know, the birds are eating and the sun is out and the trees are out and it looks very beautiful. But what's going on with the financial sector? What's going on inside people's bodies and hearts? I'm going to be volunteering for Kennedy events, I think that we need a third party. He's a very good candidate. He's a very strong candidate. And I want to stand behind him. And I want to support some people that actually have a vision for doing something different. Can he change anything? I don't know. The system is so freaking entrenched. But we've got to start getting people in office who can actually lead and have some new fresh ideas. The two-party system to me is like a corpse. It's like dead there's no life force in it there's no energy in it it's just people recycling their own personal interests it's lifeless there's no life there's no vitality there's no passion it's just gangrened these politicians and the political system to me just feels gangrened but, you know, probably people watching my channel agree with a lot of what I say. But if, if you think that Biden is the best we can do or Trump is the best we can do, 
tell me how what you think is going to happen to to this country to our debt why are we in so much debt and how are we going to get out of it why are we the sickest nation on earth and how are we going to get out of it you know why are so many people going broke and inflation is so high and young people are so discouraged how are we going to get out of it and i think that the boomers were the only generation that actually had it easy i think that life has always been hard let's look at the u.s historically you know first the pioneers came over and you know they had to fight and kill all the indians and steal their land i'm not going to get into whether that was right or wrong but that was a hard life that was a really hard life you know they had to build the railroads and build a whole country from nothing that was hard and then we had the industrial revolution and the child labor and people working long hours and coal mines and industry with no rights and little money and women having no rights that was life was hard and then we had the war world war one that was really hard then we had the Great Depression. That was really hard. And we had the Dust Bowl. I read a book about the Dust Bowl. The life was freaking hard, except for the people that had money. Life was hard for year after year after year when they were starving and working on their land and trying to grow food. And then they finally, some people had to go to California and live in these mud fields and starving. And nobody wanted them because they were dirty and muddy. Like life was hard. And it didn't, and then we had World War II, and it only got easier when we went off the gold standard and the U.S. dollar became the world cur reserve currency. Then it got easier, and we went off the, do the gold standard and we started printing money, and we started doing a bunch of like um, national things like the highway system, we'd start building infrastructure. And then we started having like labor laws and more rights for women. And I don't know what all the other changes were, but we started becoming super productive. And companies were hiring and people had pensions and health care for the whole family. Uh, the GI Bill came about and then they start building houses. Everybody could buy a house. A man who was a postal worker or an auto worker could support an entire family because his company paid health care for all. We had low inflation, so you could buy these cheap, these small houses. They could buy houses and they had pensions. Uh, Social Security came about and this was like a boom era. But then they started rating the Social Security system. That's why it's broke. They started rating the Social Security system. They start looting our productivity. They start abusing the dollar, they start printing money, and they start making all these bubbles. The first bubble I remember is the internet bubble of the late 90s. Now, I didn't participate in that because I'm like, how can you buy a stock? A stock is a share of a company. You're buying something because you want to participate in the profits of this company. But there were no profits in these companies. They were saying eyeballs, future profits. It was all a big hoax. Oh, yeah, they were all on TV telling you it was a big boom. It was a new era. We don't need to have actual profits. This is like the whole, you know, sleight of hand thing. And it all collapsed. I remember uh, I went to see this doctor in early 2000. And he was like, I will never be in the stock market again. I lost all my money. And now people forgot. People forgot. Uh, there was this big, this crash in 87 too. I don't trust the stock market. It's all built on a side of hand. Okay, then the internet bubble collapsed. They had to make a new bubble. They made the housing bubble. They knowingly, the Federal Reserve knowingly allowed all of these subprime mortgage lenders, um, option arm companies, they knowingly allowed it. They knowingly allowed it and pretended they didn't see it because they needed the financialization in the stock market, the housing market, the bond market. And now I don't know where they're doing it. It's the stock market again. They need that to keep the things going because it's not based on anything real anymore. It's not based on anything real anymore. It used to be that we were a productive nation. We People used to save money. Okay, People used to save their money and then that money was used to invest. Companies borrowed the money from the banks to invest. They 
they would want to invest in research and development, um, more capital expansion, better product research, making better products, better airplanes, better cars. And then they also, um, some of that money that we saved was used to build more infrastructure. It was used to make our country better. But then they stopped doing that. They started, companies start using their profits, not for researching for better products, not to pay the employees more, not to improve safety or quality or expand. They started using their profits to boost their share price. And nobody was calling them out on it. We all stood silently by. And then they started trying to tell you that your house was a, was a vehicle for enriching yourself rather than a place to live. And they started financializing houses. And the Federal Reserve knowingly allowed this. I'm sounding very upset because I am very upset. I just watched this in horror, you know, like we had a 30-year mortgage at the time and all these flyers would come in the mail about, you know, get this kind of mortgage and option arm or whatever. And our payment would have been like a third of what it was. I'm like, this is bullshit. This does not seem to make any sense at all. I would just throw these flyers away. It wasn't until later that I learned out what was actually happening. And I was a realtor during that time. And I would look at people's like property record, uh, tax assessor record things. And people who had bought a house for like, say, $80,000 in the 90s, they kept taking money out of their houses, money out of their houses, to the point where the 80,000 mortgage had turned into a $300,000 mortgage. And these people, this was like low, in, low income parts, like um, City Heights in San Diego, like low income stuff. And that's what fueled the economy for many years. And people used that money, not just at strip clubs, because these strippers were making so much money, but traveling, cruises, home improvement projects, kitchen remodels, cars, trips. People were taking the money on just spending it or using it to buy more houses, to speculate on real estate. Real est houses were once a thing to provide shelter for a family and some financial security that when you were retired and your house was paid off, you, at least you didn't have to pay a mortgage anymore. And then houses have become a vehicle for financial speculation, not just among the ma and pa people, but also among Wall Street. If these hedge funds is the best fucking place you can put your money is buying single family homes, that is fucked up. Doesn't anyone else see that? People keep talking about, we shouldn't let these companies, I need to calm down. <laughs> oh, you know, it's just so sad to me. People sometimes say that we shouldn't allow these hedge funds to buy single family homes. But my question is, why, why are they doing that? You know why it's sad because they no longer see any investing opportunities in this country. They don't want to invest in infrastructure. They don't want to invest in manufacturing or research or development. They, they don't see any opportunities there. That is sad. We have, you know, if you've ever walked through downtown Portland, as I did, last year or seen in the videos about, you know, downtown LA or downtown San Francisco, we've hollowed out our cities. And no one seems to care like it's sad. But anyway, let me go back to the economy. The, um, well, that is part of the economy. You know, people used to work at something productive, but we've, we've hollowed it all out. So we had the internet, we went off the gold standard, and then we started having all this money to improve the lives of people through these projects, these government projects, you know, the highway plan, the GI bill, the, the government started um, insuring mortgages through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which allowed the housing prices to boom and raise the prices of housing. Then they kind of ran out of steam, so they allowed the internet bubble. They allowed and fostered the housing bubble. And when the housing bubble burst in 2000, 
Let's see, we sold our house at the top of the market in 05. It was so good. We made this huge windfall, but the, when the everything collapsed in 07, 08, I was a realtor actually during that time. What really upset me the most, I was like, okay, now we're going to go back to baseline. We're going to allow everything to correct because these housing prices were so astronomically in bubble territory. And all of these people who fostered this, including the people at the Federal Reserve, like Greenspan, including all the Wall Street people who fostered this, they're going to be held accountable in court. Maybe have some jail time, pay some fines. Nope. Slide of hand. The banks were allowed to, they didn't have to mark down the values of these properties. The Wall Street was just like, another day no problem the federal reserve oh we didn't see this coming it was all swept under the rug and there's a um a pollster called frank lutz i used to watch him a lot i don't see him that much anymore around but he did um they did this frontline show on why trump was elected and a big reason that they gave was that people were very upset about how obama just swept this all under the rug how so many people lost their homes. I, I was involved in so many short sales and bank REOs, like writing contracts on these things. And uh, so many people lost their homes while Wall Street went totally unscathed. Nothing happened to them, nothing. And a lot of people were very upset with that. But it wasn't really Obama's fault. Bush would have done the same thing. Trump would have done the same thing. They all are part of the thing. That's what you guys have to realize. It's all part of the system, you know. Nobody wants to admit that we're broke, that we have to redo something, that we have to be willing to change, make some changes. So I do not know how the stock market is so high right now. Anyway, they never allowed the housing prices to correct to baseline. They can't. They can't. They can't allow stock prices to correct to baseline. They can't. The system requires the sleight of hand. And inflation is super high right now. I mean, that's just a consequence of just thing just starting to end, you know. Every country, every nation throughout history that has um, devalued their currency by printing more and more. It's like, oh, we can... We can make money. <laughs> we can just print money. We can just make money. That always ends, you know. This is going to end too. I don't know when, but I wish someone would talk about it and address it. And I find it very sad that in, once we were a nation of savers and it was our savings that allowed us to prosper and invest in our country, now we're borrowing. We're borrowing. Most people don't even have a thousand or ten thousand dollars to their name. We're borrowing just to pay to live today, and the companies, instead of investing in the hedge funds, instead of investing in our country, in our businesses, in research, they're just enriching themselves by buying back their stocks. They're not doing anything. You know, I'm just glad that we have places where people have free speech, and that's places like YouTube. I follow a lot of different people on YouTube. I was going to make a video about all the people I follow on YouTube. I think YouTube is really great. Uh, these social media companies, if you use them properly. I like YouTube. I don't like the other ones because there's a lot of very divisive stuff, and they foster on division like Facebook and Instagram, they foster, they foster on division. They don't care that they're hurting people. Twitter's the same way. They're just fostering on dividing us. YouTube is fun because there's no division. You know, it's just interesting stories. I love to read the comments people leave on different channels. You know, it's very interesting and we can get different views of the world. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do here with this. Like I can say whatever I want on YouTube. I'm not silenced anymore. I can talk about against the COVID vaccines. I had a strike on YouTube 
and I was afraid to even say anything else against the COVID vaccines when it was happening. I did not get the COVID vaccine. It was a big farce. It was an untested, and it's not even a vaccine because it doesn't prevent you from getting it. And now um, I have to see who put this out. There, Someone was did a survey on embalmers, um, and they're finding these huge clots, long fibrous clots in dead people when they embalm them. Because when you embalm someone, you have to drain their bodily fluids and their, their blood. And these were formed not after death, but before death. That's why these people died. Wait, I have to find that and put that on here. Okay, I found it. I'm going to link this in the description. So this is Dr. John Campbell, who is like very like kind of a pro-vaccine guy, but he had on this gentleman who did a survey of embalmers and these embalmers are finding these large whitish fiber structures and clots like long spindly clots in people's veins and arteries whatever whatever in there and and they have they they asked them when they started seeing them before covid and covid vaccines they saw zero percent of corpses have this and they found in, uh, in 2022, 30% of corpses had these. And in 2023, 20% of corpses had these large fiber structures. I'm going to show you like a graph here, a chart. Okay, this is going to be backwards. There's the chart. So they asked, what percentage of the corpses in the year 2023 that you have embalmed have had the large, whitish fiber structures and clots? And six embalmers said 80 to 100 percent. Eleven embalmers said 60 to 80 percent. The majority of them, uh, 63 embalmers said zero. And 1 to 20% of embalmers said 112. And they never saw these clots prior to 2020. Now, when you ask the embalmers about microclotting, we get a much higher number. 80% of the embalmers observed microclotting, which is like um, seeing something like coffee grounds or dirty blood in the drainage. 80%. Here's the article if you want to uh, look it up. Now, when I Googled worldwide embalmer blood clot survey, it would not come up at all. Uh, Dr. Campbell's YouTube video came up, but it did not come up. So I went to DuckDuckGo, which is a different browser than Google, and I found it immediately at the very top. So you have to be careful what they're trying to show us on Google and not show us on Google. Should not even be using Google because, you know, they're part of trying to decide what information we get. So I'm going to link the article, this um, survey from these embalmers. And they, the average embalmer had 15 years experience and averages 100 corpses per year. And they found these white fiber structures and clots um, only starting in 2022, I believe. They never saw them before that. Um, so you may want to go through that. And the thing is, neither of these political candidates are talking about any of this. They're not holding Fauci accountable. They're not holding anyone accountable. And both Biden and Trump are for the vaccine. The vaccine is very unproven and now we know has dangerous effects. Um, and no one's talking about it. again. Let's just start talking about things that are actually going on. Let's not treat our government like a lot of people treat their marriages, where you just sweep things under the rug and silently suffer. Like there's no need for that. There's no need for that. Anyway, I've said enough. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this video, and I hope that people will just wake up and not just be silently, you know, just believe everything that they're told by their government and by the media because they're not the mainstream system that's in place. They're not, you know, they don't care about us and they don't care about truth. 
They don't care about truth. They don't care about authenticity. They don't care about love. They don't care about, they're not passionate about any aliveness or opportunities or possibilities. They're just in it to maintain the status quo, status quo, us versus them, get to the top, you know, we need, we need, we need to reinvigorate from the grassroots with people actually care. And that's why I'm committed to doing my little part with um, some financial support and some tabling support for um, a third party candidate that I believe actually cares about the people and the country.